type of writing. Good morning, everybody. Let's stand. We're going to worship together. I'm just going to lead us in prayer before we get going. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you that we are here, that we made it, and that we get this moment to just pause in our week, this moment to come together and focus our attention on faith, on Jesus on the cross, on your love, on peace, on the life that we have in you. And we just ask that you would speak to us this morning, that you would fill us up, Lord, and that you would be glorified through these songs and that your name would be lifted up in um, this gathering among us, Lord. We love you, God, and give you all the glory and praise. Amen.
for your kingdom to come in our lives. Not our own kingdom, not our own things, Lord, but I pray that your will would be done in us. And that you would place your desire for your will in us. That your desire would come alive and take over our own desires, Lord. A desire for your kingdom, a desire for your plan and your covering and your power. We pray for that. We're going to have our prayer team come up and just want to invite you to come and receive prayer today if you have any needs. All the things that we face on a daily basis, things that the Lord cares about. He's not disconnected from our pain and our struggle. Amen. He's near to the brokenhearted. And so I just want to invite you guys to come and receive prayer today if you need it.
your design We walk in heaven's light We walk in heaven's light We believe this this morning We will see
It's your name, Jesus, your name alone that we worship and glorify today. We trust in who you are. We trust in your name, not just because it's something we have to do, but you've proven yourself to always be kind and always to be good. Even in the worst of moments, Lord, we can continue to see how good you are and how gracious you are. We thank you for your grace over our lives, the grace to experience goodness and kindness, even in the midst of the worst situations. We thank you, Lord. Help us to continue to fix our eyes on you today. In Jesus' name, everyone say Amen. Amen. Hey, you guys can have a seat. We're going to do something a little different this week and the next couple weeks. So I'm going to invite all the kids to come forward. We're going to do children's church in the service, and it is going to be awesome. So y'all come up here. Have a seat with Miss Kristen. And I'm going to invite Naomi and Chapman to come up on stage with me. Give it up for Naomi and Chapman, guys. Shall introduce yourself. Naomi, why don't you tell us how old you are? I'm 10. You're 10? And what's one of your favorite things to do? Um, I like to read and draw. Read and draw. And Chapman, how old are you? I am 10 years old. My name is Chapman. Chapman. I yeah. was born on January 20th. Awesome. And what's one of your favorite things to do? Um, surfing. Surfing. I didn't even prep them for those questions. They killed it. All right. So the next couple of weeks, we are going to walk through the Easter story through our resurrection eggs. And um, Naomi and Chapman are going to help us today. So we're going to open up the first one. Um, so Naomi, why don't you tell me what is in this first egg and hold it up for all the kids to see. It's a donkey that Jesus rode. That we, yeah, that he rode in on. Awesome. Yeah. So you're going to read us a verse that goes with that? Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Matthew 21, 1 through 3, 6 through 8. Awesome. All right. So Chapman, what's in our next egg? Why don't you pull that out and tell all the kids what it is? Some silver coins. Some money. Awesome. Then one of the twelve whose name was Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver, and from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Matthew 26, 14 through 16. Okay. We've got two more left. All right, Naomi, what's in this egg? Show everybody. A silver cup. A silver cup. Oh, awesome. And he took a cup, and when he had given, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many of the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, 27 through 28. Okay, awesome. And what's our last one today, Chapman? You can pull that out, show everybody. Our, la our last one today is praying hands. Praying hands. Awesome. And when they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took him with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to the death. Remain here and watch Math Mark, Mark 14, 32 and 34. Awesome. Hey, would you guys give it up for Chapman and Naomi? Kids, you guys can go to the back. You can follow uh, Miss Kristen and Miss Julie. Thank you, guys. Here's how you know homeschool's working. They can pronounce Gethsemane and Iscariot. So that's good news. That's my best joke I've had in a while. All right, so while the kids are getting out of here, if this is your first time at City Lights, welcome. We're glad that you are here. We have couple, uh, just a couple of announcements and things coming up. So we'll be doing that the next uh, two weeks. Um, 
throughout Easter. So who's excited about Easter? Yes. Who's coming to the 7 a.m. service for Easter? Okay, great. And none of you are going to come for the next service because we need the seats in the 9 and the 1030. We're excited about that. Um, so Palm Sunday is next week. Um, normal, uh, that's next week already? Oh, shoot, skis. Um, 9 and 1030. And then on uh, Good Friday, we'll have a 7 p.m. service here at the church. Um, and then Easter Sunday, 7 a.m., 9 a.m., 1030. Child care will be both at 9 and 1030. If you want to help on Easter Sunday, we will take it. Um, so talk to Kristen, talk to Oliver. You can let me know as well. We'd love to get you plugged in. Um, if you're not currently serving, we'd love to get you plugged in anyways. Um, but if you are here and can help us on Easter Sunday, we've got lots of places where you can serve. We're expecting a big crowd and lots of people, um, hopefully, that are going to hear the gospel um, for the first time. So we're excited about that. A couple of other things that we have coming up. How many of you were at the equipping environment a few weeks ago? Two of you, great. Well, we've got one more coming up. I think we have a picture. So this was from Brian Aachen, um, a really good crowd. And um, we've got our last spring equipping environment coming up on the 21st, I believe. I'm like looking at Oliver, yes, please. Um, yes, here we go, great. Um, so we will have our last equipping environment for the spring. Um, it's gonna be on personal prayer. We've got a pastor coming from Hope Church. Um, that's going to be on April 21st. You can sign up online or in the city, uh, the church center app. Um, Kristen wanted me to make sure that everyone knows that child care deadline from here on out for every event is one week before. So if you need child care for this event or any other event, sign up now. Um, otherwise, you have to take it up with her. And I wouldn't want to do that if I were you. Um, and then finally, City Life is going to be on April 14th. Um, City Life is our uh, vehicle for membership, and so if you've been coming to City Lights for some time and you're ready to call City Lights home and get plugged in, uh, we would love to have you. So that's going to be on April 14th. It'll be from uh, 12 to 1.30 after the second service. We will have lunch and child care provided. Um, you can also sign up online for that. I think last time we had a record of like 42 new members, which is pretty significant when you think about how small of a church we are. Um, so if you want to help break that record and stress Oliver and Kristen out, you can sign up online for that. Um, if you would, fill out an info card or a prayer card in front of you, especially if it's your first time. We'd love to get to know you, get you plugged in, um, get you in the city group and things like that. So um, you can give online at citylights.cc. You can also give through the Planning Center app. 10% um, of everything you give goes out the door to missions. And um, everything else helps us to do what we feel the Lord has called us to do here at City Lights and in Greenville. So I'm going to pray for us. Oliver comes up, and um, we will continue on our service. So, Lord, I thank you. Um, God, for a chance to worship this morning, Lord, I thank you for um, the family that um, we've built in our building here at City Lights. God, I ask that you would um, just continue to multiply it, that you would um, bring folks in that need a place to go. God, people that feel lonely, people that feel um, maybe disillusioned with church, God, I ask that um, City Lights would be a safe place for them um, to feel redemption and hope and um, peace. Um, God, I thank you for our kids, the kids' ministry we have going downstairs. God, I ask that you would uh, work in their hearts this morning. I'm glad that you would draw them close to you. Um, God, and as Oliver speaks, we ask that um, his words would be your words and that you would convict our hearts, that you would um, bring peace to our hearts, and that you would encourage us. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning. How are you guys doing? I'm so happy to get my Britney Spears mic back on my face. If I uh, feel like I had to get used to like what I do with my hands when I don't hold a microphone now, I'm going to be like all over the place. Uh, figure that out again, but I'm uh, I'm happy to um, to uh, get get into uh, singing my solos of it's going to be May. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, uh, also, um, shout out to uh, to Gavin. Sorry, Gavin, that I stole your music stand today. Um, it was for a good cause. I stole Gavin the bassist uh, music stand today because Julie has my music stand and she wrote a curriculum for all of our kids for Easter. And uh, as it were, sometimes the kids' curriculum when you try to reach everybody, you kind of end up missing some pieces of trying to um, go to the deep places of, of the gospel. So Julie Hafer, give her a pat on the back, uh, loves kids so much and Jesus, and she's uh, written a curriculum, and she's going to get it going for the next couple of uh, Sundays here at the church downstairs. And, um, uh, and actually, one of the uh, teaching props, I was thinking, how do I get out of this service and go downstairs to see what Julie's doing uh, next Sunday? But uh, other than that, my, uh, my kind of opening comments there, if you guys would open up to Mark uh, chapter 9, um, and I would love to... Um, uh, kind of continue on um, in our study of the suffering servant um, through the book of Mark uh, this morning. Um, 
shout out to Colin, who's uh, engaged now. Way to go, buddy. I just wanted to say that as well. Congrats. Yeah, yeah. We're going to have a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great day today. All right, so, um, so um, me and Kyra got married in, in 2005, and, and we've got the four kids. And I just want to um, kind of go after a, a myth that I think uh, gets told to me a lot. And sometimes, I'm, if you ever consider this myth, there's a saying that they'll tell you about how to be a parent that, that goes like this, kids don't do uh, what, you, uh, what you say, they'll do what you do. You ever heard this saying? That's completely a lie. You know, that's not, a, that's not true. That's not true. Because the reality is that they don't do what you do or what you say. That's the point, right? And, and, I, and I'll prove it to you, is like, I'm not perfect at a lot of things in life. Something that I do really good is flush the toilet. I'm great at that. Like, I'm batting a 1,000. I'll flush the toilet 10 out of 10. You give me 10 times, I'll flush it 10 times. You know what kids don't do? That, okay? They're batting 5,000, 500, at, you know, at, at greatest at most. Uh, you know, kids are not doing necessarily what you say or what you do. They do what they want. Okay, that's the point, right? You know, I'm really good at wearing socks. I wear socks every day of my life. Not a problem. I'm really successful. I don't want to brag about that, but I haven't missed a day in a while. And I also put on my seatbelt. It's, it's just a habit. Now, some of you guys might need to work on that, but I wear my seatbelt all the time, and my kids uh, do not do that all the time because t- kids don't ultimately do uh, what you do or what you say. Do what, do what, do what you, they want to do of what you say and what you do. And uh, truth be told, um, that doesn't always just... Um, shed its grip on us, you know, our selective hearing to hear what we want and do what we want and see what we want. Once you become adults, me and Kyra get into every now and again moments of intense marriage fellowship whereby we think we said something, but we didn't say something, or maybe we did say and the other person didn't hear it. Case in point, when we first got married, uh, there was this one Christmas where I had asked for a juicer. I was ahead of the game, and I was like, I want a juicer. I want oranges and bananas and pineapples. I just want juice. And every time I say that for Christmas time, she'd be, she'd be like, by a juicer, you must mean a smoothie maker. And I was like, I don't think so. I think there's a difference. I, I didn't really know the difference really about all the pulp and all that kind of thing. But I was like, I, I want a juicer. And when I say juicer, I mean a juicer. And she was like, no, that's not what you mean. You mean a smoothie maker. This is what she meant. And, uh, and, and she actually said it, Thomas, so many times that I actually, because there's the Holy Spirit and then there's Kyra, actually started to believe maybe I need a smoothie maker and not a juicer. And then Christmas morning or whatever, I got the stupid smoothie maker, and I made my little smoothie with it, and I was like, this isn't juice. <laughs> I can't, I don't know what to tell you. I needed a, I wanted a juicer. I didn't want a smoothie maker, right? People don't, people don't, you know, do what you do or do what you say. They do what they want. That's, that's the ultimate reality, okay? So, so, right, so if you're, um, if you're a kid, if you're an adult, if you're a teacher, you're dealing with kids, if you're dealing with employees or whatever it may be, you know, you're, you're mindful of this thing is people are not doing what you say or what you do, what they're doing what they want to do. And, uh, and, and there's, great, um, there, there's great heart. There's taking, taking heart uh, and, and taking courage in the reality that of all the people, kids, adults, or grandparents in the room, that, that, uh, that don't get listened to on the things that they say, probably the number one public enemy of the person that says the most things that don't get listened to, it's got to be Jesus, right? <laughs> of all the people that, that's, that's, that's constantly trying to um, send and show a clear message of the gospel, of all the people that have ever been misunderstood in this world, you got to put Jesus as the, as the number one person that was misheard, misheard and misunderstood. So here's, here's the passage that we read maybe two Sundays ago uh, in terms of the, uh, the epitome, the essence of the gospel according to Jesus in Mark chapter 8, and compare that to what you see and hear on YouTube and Instagram and um, sometimes out of pulpits. But Mark 8 says this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Is this the message that we hear sometimes? Verse 35, uh, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever wants to lose their life for the sake of the gospel, well, they're actually going to save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, says Jesus, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? All of us, at some degree or another, get misheard and misrepresented and misquoted and misunderstood. But out of all the people, of all the misunderstandings of the world, nobody's misunderstood more than Jesus. There are three things I'll I'll put on the screen there that I think will help us understand, and if we're really clear and honest with ourselves about what Jesus is saying to us, through this scripture and pretty much every other scripture in the Bible, three misunderstandings that the scripture can help us re-understand about Jesus is, uh, first and foremost, Jesus um, did not come, unlike popular opinion, to save us from suffering. He came to save us from sin. And so when you sit down, you'll, you'll hear people say, oh, I'm a believer and I'm a Christian and I believe in the Holy Spirit. Uh, but when you listen to their version of the gospel, um, it is not so much death to life, but um, from no stuff to stuff. How do you know that God exists? Well, he's in my life. He's really moving. He got me a new truck. He got me a new job. He told me where to go. That the narrative that you hear when people say that they believe the gospel and, they, and they've been born, you know, dead to alive, 
what the narrative of their life is and the way they tell their story is not from death to life, it's from no stuff to stuff. Or, or it's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the guru Jesus, like, um, like uh, every now and again, you know, I, I run my life the way that I want to, but every now and again, like when, you know, um, the possibility of divorce or sickness or, or uh, my children running the wrong direction comes about, then, I, then all of a sudden I knock on Jesus' door to try and get the wisdom because the gospel, everybody knows, is to, is to move uh, people that don't know stuff to people that know how to do stuff because the gospel is not about death to life, it's about knowing stuff, it's about wisdom. Um, or, or through prophecy, you know, the story of the gospel is, uh, at one point, I didn't really know which direction to go or which job to pick or which school to go to, and then Jesus came, and the reason why I know Jesus is good is he told me which way to go. But if you look at the, the passage here, um, that Jesus is being misunderstood uh, in all of those stories, because the ultimate goal of Jesus is not to spare us from, from pain, not that he's a masochist and wants us to have pain or endure pain, but he wants to save us from sin. Number two, uh, a really common misunderstanding is Jesus did not come to take life, but to give his life as a ransom, and to save our soul. Have you ever been so heartbroken um, that you didn't want to eat? Have you ever gone through a, a period of time where uh, even though you hadn't eaten for several days, uh, because of the tragedy, because of a, of a loss, because of a betrayal that's going on in your life, you just can't stomach food anymore? Uh, isn't that such a strong statement to us about the order and the precedence and the priority of how we are constructed even as, as humans, um, is that ultimately um, that... Um, that there is a difference between body and soul, that the body was created for the soul, soul not created for the body, and the world can't save the soul, only Jesus can. That I can be sitting in front of food and still be hungry because ultimately my soul can't be fed by the world, it can only be fed by Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus didn't come to save my, my body, he did ultimately, but deeper than that he came to save my soul. Have you ever forgiven somebody or been forgiven of something and fe felt the weight that had been sitting on your shoulders for the last couple of weeks just lift off of your body because the world can't, you know, forgive your soul. Only Jesus can offer forgiveness and atonement for that. Jesus didn't come to save our body so much as he came to save our soul. Or you've been uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the great trip that you planned on and, and you went out to go see the sights and as soon as you saw the sights, you realized the, the vacancy, the gap of, I wish that I could have somebody that I could go along with to come and see these sights with me uh, because, because there is a difference between where the body is and where the soul is. So Jesus did not come to save us from suffering and he didn't just come to save our body, but he saved us from sin and to save our souls. And that ultimately, what we're going to read about today um, is that what that actually means in order to save our souls is not just to make the goal of Christianity to make Christians sinless, but to make Christians servants. The, the epitome, the, um, the extreme, the full expression of what a Christian is is just not a person in their pickup truck avoiding drinking and smoking and hanging out with girls who do, but it's to be made into the likeness of Jesus, which is to become a servant, is to give their life as a ransom for neighbors and people that they love and people that they hate and people that they don't talk to, family members and friends, is that to truly understand Jesus, not to be saved from suffering, but to be saved from sin, not to, not to have Jesus be the, the Nazi police and the moral uh, police um, that comes to judge us. Rather, he came not to judge us, but to save us and to save our soul, that we would be free, free of our ambitions and free of our insecurities and free of our, 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 um, our, our, our manipulation of our relationships to, to, to free and to save our souls. And the way that that looks, the way that that looks in the lives of everyday Christians is not to become sinless, uh, which it is, it is to be the righteousness of Christ, but even more so than that is to become servants. And so the way that you break through to, to teenagers or adults or kids in general, the answer is you just have to tell them 17 times. That's the answer, is that teenagers want to talk to you at 10 o'clock at night. So if you want to talk to a teenager, you don't talk to them at 10 in the morning, you got to talk to them at 10 at night, that's when they want to talk. When you want to sleep, that's when they want to talk. You have to be ready to talk to them on car rides, and you have to be able to do conversations and not lectures. You have to say it seven times before it actually breaks through to see the actual meaning. And so we're going to talk about three topics with Jesus today, the discussion of greatness, the discussion of servanthood, and the discussion of um, discipleship in verse 30. So it says, they left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. Uh, the book of Mark is divided up into three different portions. The first eight chapters is about the public ministry of Jesus. The last um, uh, 12 through 16, four chapters, is about the passion of Jesus, the death of Jesus and the resurrection. And the middle eight to ten section is, a, is the private teaching of the disciples. If I went out with Wayne to get trained to be a police officer, there's things uh, that he wouldn't be able to tell me in front of a, a, a car that he pulled over with a kid in the back seat. There's many different things that he's... Um, prioritizing in his mind as he pulls over the car and he's, he's analyzing and assessing things at speed and I'm just watching and observing and there's things that I would miss if he didn't debrief with me on the way back into the patrol car. 
And so Jesus pulls aside his disciples and gives a private instruction. And this is why Jesus doesn't just go out to street corners and tell everybody just to move to Africa to become missionaries. There is, there's steps and sequences to the, uh, the discipleship invitation. And so what he didn't seem to be fitting to tell the crowd, he was saying to be fitting to be telling the disciples at this point in verse 31 at the very end, uh, 31b. And he says to his disciples, not the crowds, the Son of Man, this is the second time he said it because we're hard-headed, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he'll rise. And verse 32 says, but they didn't understand what he meant because they're afraid to ask him about it. There are certain things that your parents were very clear about, like the rated R movies that you weren't allowed to watch. And the reason why you didn't, you pretended like you didn't know what your parents' opinion were, and the reason why you didn't ask them, because you already knew what the answer was going to be. <laughs> the reason why you, you asked uh, for an apology rather than ask for permission is because you knew from the beginning what your parents were going to say. And so they're knowing, they're, they're understanding that the Son of Man has come to bring salvation, the salvation of souls, but not to kill enemies, but to die for enemies. And so they're afraid to ask him these questions because they kind of are starting to get the, the picture of what the actual answer is. And so verse 33 says that they continue to move south. Galilee to Capernaum, Jerusalem is a, is a downward trek into Jerusalem, into the death of Jesus. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what are you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because the way they had been arguing about and what they had been arguing about was about who was the greatest um, among them. So this is the third time that the word argue has been used in the book of Mark. The first time was uh, arguing over who forgot the bread. You big doofus, you forgot the bread. You always do that, you know. Now, the second time uh, was what um, Brian Onkin was talking about, is that the crowds were arguing while this demon-possessed boy is not being delivered. The crowds and the disciples are arguing, probably about politics or theology or something stupid, other than just praying for the demon-possessed person. And uh, what was so interesting about it, I love Brian Onkin's answer for what Jesus meant when he said, this demon only comes about out by prayer, is that uh, Brian was explaining to us in the book of Mark, I think accurately, is that prayer is not just an action, it's a lifestyle. And that if, that if somebody is not living their life prayed up, then there's no sort of activating uh, vocabulary you could use in the moment that can, can, can be a, um, a cantation that leverages uh, deliverance of demons. And so what he's saying is that the disciples' boat had already passed because while they should have been praying, they were arguing. And so the point is, is if you watch the beginning of the non-example and the bottom of the, non of the example in the book of Mark in chapter uh, 9, I think what Mark is basically saying um, is that the opposite of prayer is not prayerlessness. The opposite of prayer is arguing. The opposite of talking to God about your problems is talking to people about your problems. And whether that turns out to be um, politics or whether it comes out to be nominationalism or division, the point is, is that there's a great cost to arguing because every moment you're arguing, you're talking to the wrong person. And as you argue, argue the world suffers. How many times have you seen churches and their egos and their arguments and their their politics, distracting their attention into each other rather than focusing their attention outwards to see a, a world delivered, that the opposite of, 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 of prayer is not prayerlessness, it's arguing. It's arguing. Okay, so um, a couple of uh, Jimmy Fallon quotes to get us going this morning. Uh, if you guys ever watch um, hashtag Jimmy Fallon, um, there was a hashtag a while ago called My Dumb Fights. My parents once fought over who makes louder chewing noises, and my dad got a loaf of bread and said, let's settle this right now, which I got to be honest, that's a good move. I, I feel like I might do that one time because Kyra thinks I chew super loud, and I just feel like I'm a human. This is what we, okay, I don't understand. All right, my friends and I were outside making shadows looking like they were fighting, and I accidentally punched her in the face. The shadow is like lining up, and then there's blood on the ground, and it's like my shadow beat you up. All right, um, my wife and I got into an argument over whether Mickey and Minnie were married or just dating. And uh, Jimmy Fallon actually explained this. The answer is Walt Disney. They asked him that Mickey and Minnie are actually like Desi and, um, and Lucy and that they're married in real life. And depending on the episode, they might be married, dating, or just friends depending on the episode because they're actors just acting things out, which is just wild to think about that Mickey was an actor, not a wizard. You know, that's wild to think about. All right. My dumb fight was about my dog's name. Boyfriend wanted something uh, funny and I wanted something awesome. So we settled on Tom Hanks. I feel like that's not a fight. That's a compromise. That's a good answer. My sister slapped me on the face while my parents were out, and I kept hitting my cheek, so it was red once my parents got, got back, and that's something I definitely would have done. Uh, and then uh, I rode my bike over to this kid's house. This will be the last one. I rode my bike over to this kid's house, and I was supposed to fight, but he got a Nintendo 64. He had golden eyes, so we just played it instead. So that's, that's what brings people together. All right, so everybody, you didn't do anything to me. I'm not coming out here with violence to try and hurt your feelings, okay? This is from the Bible, all right? But um, both in terms of... Uh, I think these tweets, if you reflect on them, 
our lives and experience in the scripture, I think that uh, the scripture that I want to share with you in just a moment, and in James and the one that we just read in Mark, is saying that the arguments that you and I get into with our sisters, our brothers, our coworkers, our, 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 our siblings, our spouses, they don't so much have to do with issues that they have to do with idols. That quarrels, that fights, uh, they don't have to do so much with the actual topics we're talking about. They have to do with the, the covetousness in our heart of the things we're trying to take from other people that we don't trust God to give us. I'm sorry I didn't wake up to offend you, but that's what the Bible's doing this morning. I'll give you three proofs, just examples in life, and then we'll go into the scripture, because that's more important. But number one is, I taught U.S. history for seven years. And every year, I taught about the triangle trade, uh, slavery, the black codes, the Civil War, Reconstruction, and the Jim Crow South. And not one of those time, times did my temper flare or, my, or did tears fall from my eyes. Reconcile for me, if, I, if, 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 arguments, if arguments are really about idols versus issues, that why I can stand straight-faced talking emotionless about the slaveries of the South and then yell in embittered uh, comments to people as I'm driving down Woodruff in 385. If it's about issues and not idols, why do I have tears for myself in the car and emotionlessness for slavery and racism in America? If it's about issues and not idols. If it's, about, if it's about issues and not idols, then why are there some people that are constantly getting in quarrels? Constantly, if we all have the same amount of issues, the same amount of problems, there are some people that are constantly in fights and people you can't barely drag into a fight. If it's really about issues, then why aren't we fighting equally? If it's really about, if it's really about the issues, people say, well, I have the anger of God and I have righteous anger. You know, Jesus turned over tables. Jesus says that anger is something that we should practice without sin. But he also commands forgiveness. And I can't point to you one time that I've been forgiving of somebody and angry at them at the same time. The reason why I know it's, it's idols, not issues, is because when I'm full, I don't need to fight you. When I'm secure and not insecure and when I'm, when I'm feeling strong in my identity and I have what I want from the Lord, I can have an issue with you, but I don't have to fight you about it. So that's the test point of why, why arguments get in the way of really the kingdom and prayer James uh, 4 says it this way, what, what, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Not just like certain fights or, or the ones where you actually like go outside of a bar, like any amount of division beyond just expressing my need and speaking the truth that escalates into volumes and quarrels and back and forth and, 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 and quarreling, that category under James is all idolatry. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have it because you don't ask God. You're trying to take from somebody what only God can give you. When you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you want on your pleasures. And so I have three questions for you the next time you get upset. Being upset is a wonderful opportunity. Because in Bible study, you're not going to be upset because everybody's got their face on and we're all talking about abstract theologies. When you're angry in the fight, that's probably the next place that God, the next topic that God wants you to talk to you about. And when you go out with a cup of tea and walk around the block, I want you to ask yourself three questions. This is an opportunity to align my will with him because the opposite of arguing is not peace, it's alignment with God. It's a conversation with God, and this argument is an opportunity to see how my will is different from his. So the next time you're in a fight, ask yourself three questions. Number one, you're probably, you're probably mad about something that's relatively legit legitimate, so just ask yourself, what part of what I want right now that I didn't get is aligned with God? There's probably something righteous there that needs to be thought about. Now, the way you're going about it is probably not righteous if you're quarreling and, and gossiping and carrying on in your mind and killing people and giving people the silent treatment, right? Here's the second question. What do I want that God doesn't want? Because there's probably an overlapping circle that your will and his will are the same, but there's parts of your will that are not his will. So, so working through that, what part of uh, what I want is not what God wants, and what do, does God want that I don't want? Those are three questions, I think, that allow us to move from argument to agreement with Jesus. Because the opposite of, of arguing is not peace, it's prayer. It's communion with Jesus. All right, so the second topic he gets into is not greatness, but it's servanthood. So verse 35, it says that Jesus sat down. He sat down with his disciples. And Jesus calls the 12, and he says, anyone, anyone that wants to be first must be last, and they have to be a servant of all. Now, what you recognize by this, when Jesus sits down, he's headed down to his own death. 
he's, he's leading around these disciples that while he's about to die are arguing over who has a better singing voice during worship. And he sits down, and it should dawn on us that it's not just the words of Jesus, but it's the actions of Jesus. As he defines servanthood in this next passage, he's not telling them to do anything he's not doing already. That he is, he's, always, he's always modeling and setting the example of what he's about to ask us to do, to be a servant. And so if you look at the definition I have there um, on the screen, if you go through the Bible, really all of the Bible, let alone Mark, I think the best definition that I could think of for serving is serving is an action-oriented thing. You can't sit around and think well about people and call that serving. You have to do something about it. It's action-oriented, but it's also obedience-oriented. It's not becoming a doormat. It's following whatever the Father says and offering your life as a sacrifice the way Jesus did. And oftentimes, it's at my own expense. It's not a, it's not a win-win. It's a lose-win right? That's what serving is. So Jesus takes a seat, and he kind of puts to words the thing he's always been doing. He's always been healing and not really boasting up his own ego and preaching on his own preaching campaign. He's always been obedient. He always wants everything to be a secret when he heals people. This is the example that he's always been setting, and it's been his own expense. The more he, he heals people, the more he gets plotted against for murder and smacked in the mouth. And so he's basically telling us when he says, be a servant, to do what I've been doing, if you've, if you've been watching it, right? Now, what he moves to next is not so much the actions, but it's the attitude that he wants to get across. Because how many of you guys know that you could wash the dishes and vacuum the floors of a church or preach a sermon, and, and all of that, those things are wonderful things to do, but without the attitude of a servant. The attitude of a servant, verse 36, is by taking a little child whom he placed among, who, he, who he had among them. He takes the child in his arms, and he says this, whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. Now, we've got to get in our mind right now of what Jesus means when he says child. We have a very Disney, romanticized, one sociologist I read this week is called the kindergarten of like, kids are awesome. <laughs> kids are funny and they're smart and they're charming and adults are all the boring and awful things that kids, you know, should never have become. And so we have a kind of kid worship to some degree in, in our culture because we love to be young, right? But back then, that's not, not what kids were doing. Kids were basically unseen, unheard, unvalued. They were the least. We've got to recapitulate what, what we think of when we think of kids. And so when Jesus um, is taking beside a child and says, serve this child, what he's basically saying is serve the unimportant. Serve the special needs. Serve the socially unaware. Serve people that are awkward and annoying. Serve people that have no value to you, with no strings, with no agenda. Just give to give, is what he says. And then he talks about the ambition of this. Follow this in verse 37. The ambition... The ambition of this is not because it's the right thing to do or because it's nice and somebody did something nice to you or because it's a great way to build an organizational culture and you don't want people grabbing for power so you should, you know, serve uh, or because it's a successful thing because it leads to um, the promotion, you know, of your reputation in the community. This is the, this is the real ambition, the motive of a servant, not just what you're doing but why you do it. It's because he says, when you serve people that can't serve you back and have no strings attached to it, you're not just welcoming them, you're welcoming me. In other words, the reward of serving is serving. The reward of serving is a walk with Jesus. And, and the joy, apparently, of Jesus is not just doing the act of serving, but it's the joy of walking along with his Father because this is the free life. Every summer, um, between the ages of 10 and 18, I would go to Hong Kong uh, for six weeks in a row to go visit my dad. It was hot. It was about 102 degrees every single time, and they had typhoons there. And uh, I just ate fried rice the whole time and was a jolly, happy Buddha kid. Just had a great time, you know, living in Hong Kong. And uh, it was a big culture shock to me, like the ways that kids acted and the ways that kids, you know, thought and talked. You know, when you go to dinner with the big Chinese family, you know, Dai Bot, the uncle has to eat first, and you have to, like, bow to him and all this crazy stuff. And it was, you know, kind of cool to me because I like kung fu movies, but it was also a little bit weird and intimidating, you know what I mean, to have, like, this patriarchal kind of society. And, uh, and it was so interesting to me, you know, the power of culture, the things that you do that you don't know why you do them, and you just assume that everybody does them because it's the only way to do them. You go to another culture, you're like, oh, snap, there's other ways to do stuff, okay? And, uh, and one of the big culture things, and I love America, and just hear me say that, I love America. I'm not saying that Chinese people are even awesome at all, okay? But this is the one thing that I did notice when you go over there about weaknesses and strengths because where you live, you're just picking an idol, you're just picking the culture and the flavor of what you want to value over Jesus. That's what you're doing. So everywhere has brokenness. But let me just tell you the top three things that a Chinese dad does not care about, okay? When you go to Hong Kong, your Chinese dad does not care where you want to go to dinner. He doesn't care, right? That's not, that's not what this, the way this thing is built. Here's what else Chinese dads don't care about. Your Enneagram score. The Chinese dads could not care less if you're a six or a two or one. Make your bed. I don't care. Like, that's the attitude, right? 
This doesn't, you know, they do not care ultimately really even about your feelings that much. Like there's an honor code to this thing and there's a first and a last and you're not first, right? You're not first. And so here's, here's what I would say. It's like you go over there and you realize, you know, the blindsidedness of what you have and what you don't. You come back and see maybe your home for the very first time is I'm just, I'm just uh, proposing to you when you, when you consider, our, you know, our culture and the good and bad and idiosyncrasy of it, the pursuit of self-actualization, self-identity, what's my personal style profile, what's my Enneagram number, what's my preference, how, what color is my iPhone, how many gigabytes do I have on it? When you consider the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit, uh, pursuit of individual happiness, do you know anybody that has pursued that or gotten to the end of that and is not ultimately miserable? Are, are, are we not like aware of the fact that the more I go after the importance and the significance, which is what all arguments are about, greatness in the first place, and why I matter, and why my feelings matter, and their feelings don't matter, and my narrative matters, and theirs doesn't matter, and why my needs and my desires matter, and why theirs matter. Does anybody see the pursuit of that leading anywhere but misery? And so this invitation to servanthood is not, is not to become a martyr. It's to become free. It's to forget yourself. This is what uh, C.S. Lewis says, best definition of humility, right? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking less about yourself. That he is not asking us to lose our life. He's giving it to us in the, in the first place. This is an opportunity, not even for the person you're serving, but for, for you yourself to forget yourself is ultimate freedom. The way I have it on the screen there is Jesus' discipleship is not calling us to servanthood, ultimately, to be an invitation to be inconvenienced. A lot of times we see the servant message and we're like, I know I'm a servant because I do hard things. That's not ultimately what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't say, be a servant, so wash the dishes for your wife. He's talking about not the hands, but the heart. And the heart of the servant is not necessarily how much hard stuff I do. Or some people will say, oh, to be great must mean, you know, that you stop trying to work in Hollywood because everybody in Hollywood couldn't be in service and everyone that was in, you know, um, Silicon Valley that works in computers or be successful. He's not telling you not to be successful. He's telling you not to be a celebrity and not allow your heart to make yourself more important than you are. He's not actually calling you to unhappiness. Actually, the call to service is ultimate happiness. What he is calling us to is unimportance. That you and me have a me monster inside of us. And that me monster is concerned constantly with how I look, how I'm treated, and what I want. And there's all sorts of ways to work hard and be successful or unsuccessful. There's all sorts of ways to be inconvenienced. There's all sorts of ways to like make myself as unhappy as possible while I blame other people for being happier than me or whatever it is. There's all sorts of ways to do all those things, but yet be important to myself. And what Jesus is saying, hey, if you want to find your life, then lose your importance. Give yourself, retire and, fi and fire yourself and, and, and spend, spend a day even focused on forgetting what you want, forgetting how you look, and forgetting what you're getting out of situations and tell me if you're not happier because of it. Tell me you're not happier if you forget yourself and find happiness on the other side. Do you know anybody that's focused on what they want and how they look and what they want ending up any happier, holier, or more helpful? Nobody in that pursuit is ever happier, holier, or more helpful. So he closes up in the definition of discipleship, verse 38. Teacher, uh, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he's not one of us. Now, first 80 times I've ever read this passage, I thought it was about the qualitation, qualitative measures of how somebody gets delivered. I thought it was about, well, I mean, I guess if they're delivered in Jesus' name by a Christian, I guess that could Christians deliver demons and non-Christians? Are these people Christians? And I thought about it from a qualitative level. But really, this passage is not about the qualitative nature of a healing. It's actually about the credit that disciples get, right? Why are they frustrated? Here's the irony of it. They just sat at the base of a mountain arguing with other uh, Pharisees and Sadducees while a, a boy was, you know, stricken with demons. They couldn't deliver the demon out of this kid. And after they got done with that, they're not concerned with the fact that somebody has gotten delivered of a demon. They're concerned with the fact they're not getting credit for it. So I'm sitting here, right? There's a Google review. Somebody gave us a one-star Google review on church. And, you know, I went through my offenses, offends, offended stage, and then I went through my, like, what's the right thing to do stage. And if you go read it, I, I wrote a nice little note. I don't, I don't, you know, hopefully I didn't get stumble in your way, and, like, I really hope, I, I would hate for the church to get in your way of Jesus. You know, it was basically my message. But reading this passage, I, all, I thought about that. I was like, oh, boy, that was a really humble thing for me to do. That was really servant-hearted, right? Okay, so that's better than yelling at her, right? But here's what I didn't do. I didn't get on Brookwood's website and go through their Google reviews because my name's, name's not on that website. This morning I got up, I prayed uh, for church this morning, 
and, uh, you know, probably tried to get over my nerves of public speaking again, you know, and I walked around and prayed at five in the morning. That sounds really holy, right? You, you know, when I go on vacation, and I go to visit other churches, when I wake up five minutes before church, just like y'all, <laughs> right? Because no matter how hard we try, like, like the agenda, it's not always about the actions, right? It is about the attitude. And no matter how hard I try, uh, the credit, like the ambition and the approval and how I look and how I feel oftentimes gets in the way of the healing. That we could have the kingdom of heaven if it only wasn't for our egos. That the world suffers while we argue because of our egos, because all the fights are really about me. I want to be great. What about my needs? What about how hot I want the air conditioning? Like it's always about me. And I hide it in all sorts of different ways, but the, the, the heart of the servant is just as important in the hands of the servant. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water, oh no, I skipped over it, verse 39, uh, do not stop him, Jesus says, for no one who does a miracle in my name can uh, at the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. Notice Jesus' priorities there is not me and then them and then Jesus. It's Jesus and then them and then me. That the, that the context of how I envision the question is, is Oftentimes, at my own expense, I'm, I'm worried about how I look, how I'm treated, what I want. And what Jesus is in, inviting us to is the saved life. Do you want to lose your life or save your life? Do you want the world or do you want your soul? If you want your soul, then you should spend your life thinking about what the Father wants, how the Father looks, and how the Father's treated. If you want to lose your life, then think about you. If you want to gain your life, Jesus is saying, then think about us. So he closes up verse 41. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of cold water in my name, because you, that's the first time you is ever brought into it, after him and after them, you belong to the Messiah. You will certainly not lose your reward. And so here's why we can continually and consistently think about others and think about how others are treated and look and what, they, what other people want, is because ultimately the, the, the greatest care about how I look and how I treat and how I want is better in the hands of the Father than in myself. That the call to servanthood is not about losing a life, it's about finding it. And that he's the one that takes care of all of my, my everyday needs. And so, so we are ultimately unimportant, but in a strange way, we're kind of really important. When we trust our self-importance, we lose our importance, but when we trust Jesus to take care of us in our importance, then we actually find eternal importance. That's the irony of it, is if I care for myself, I, I ruin myself. If I live in a way that I allow God to care for me, I actually find the greatest significance of all eternity. This is how Paul says in Philippians 2. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each other's interests and of others. What he's saying is that, um, that ultimately anything that we would, uh, we would get into discussion about, if it were to escalate into a debate or division, that's not of God. There's, nobody, there's no version of of division in the church that's healthy conflict. There's no such thing as healthy division in the church. That's an oxymoron. So every moment, moment we spend arguing, we're not spending praying. And arguing doesn't fix it. Praying does. So spend more time praying. Okay? And so that ambition can get supplanted by what the ambition of Christ is. Verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. Don't just do what he did, but do it for the same reasons as he did it. And this is the, this is the mindset of Christ. Verse 6, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be taken to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. What does C.S. Lewis say about humility? Humility is not doing more work for more people. It's becoming unimportant. It's forgetting myself. There's freedom and significance in not making it about me. Do I want the world or do I want my soul? Because you can't have both in many cases. Rather, he made himself nothing. The most important person in the world made himself unimportant. By taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself to become obedient to death on the cross. And this is how God treated him. When I allow myself to care for myself, I ruin myself and don't care for myself. When I allow God to take care of me and my needs and I trust him through prayer instead of arguing, I actually get taken care of better than anyone. Verse 9, therefore God exalted him in the highest place and gave him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow and every, every, heaven, uh, every knee in heaven and earth um, would recognize him in verse 11. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this is my sermon and sentence that's up here. <clears throat> Servanthood is not an action, it's an attitude. And we become servants. This is the good life. that he, He's not saving us from suffering. He's saving us from ourselves to be free in our soul, to eat 
real spiritual food, to have real spiritual relationships, to actually have real kingdom significance is to become a servant. It's the same thing. So we become servants, not by doing more stuff, but by recognizing that Jesus, the most important person, became unimportant. He's the most important person, and he didn't count that as being important. He made himself unimportant. He took no credit or, or, or no approval from man so that, because his singular mission was this, to, 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 to change how we're treated by the Father and how we're seen by the Father and how, how our desires come before the Father, the most unimportant people, including myself, um, could become important to the Father. I'll invite uh, the team to come forward as we um, transition to communion. I'll put up a, a quick intentional question here. Three questions for where can I serve, which is the kids' ministry, let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> but the heart of, of serving is asking, where am I important to myself? Where do I make it about me? Number two, where can I, where can I pick Christ's importance? He is a better steward of how we look and how we're treated and, and what we want and what the desires of our hearts are. Where can I pick Christ's importance to actually find real importance? And lastly, where can I serve the unimportant? I guarantee you, if this passage is true and probably your experience as well, that the happiest, most holy, most healthy, and most helpful people are people that forget themselves. How can you choose unimportance to serve the unimportant? I think there is a, um, a lot of uh, salvation and a lot of um, life for our soul if we were to trust those words. Um, Mark 14, uh, for communion this morning, says this in verse 22. While they're eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take this, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, and he drank from it. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Uh, if you are a believer in the room, um, I would love for you to and just engage in prayer as we approach uh, the bread and the cup this morning. If you're not, uh, just invite you to look on. So glad that, you, that you're here, um, and maybe consider the invitation this, this morning of uh, what it might mean to... Um, Trust Christ for your salvation. But if, but if you've already done that, um, let's just um, invite the Holy Spirit as we take communion this morning. And so, Father, I thank you to the left and the right, our symbols, Lord Jesus, of, um, of the facts we need. Um, if we've ever wavered this week, wondered if, um, if you'd forgotten about us, wondered if um, our prayers were heard, wondered if... Um, our service was, was valued. Um, I just thank you for um, the fact of Calvary this morning over this place. Lord, I just thank you that we, uh, we don't have to feel good to trust you. We don't have to have emotions, Lord, um, to act on what we believe. And so I just thank you for the life and the death and the resurrection of your son. Lord, that the one that you sent for us um, was just tortured on our behalf, um, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. I just thank you, Jesus, that, um, that uh, you died the death we couldn't, you know, to give us life. And, um, and so, um, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just search our hearts this morning, as I know that your ambition this morning is freedom. It's for, it's for freedom that Christ set us free. Is there anything... Um, that we need to be forgiven of this morning. We just always forget how much burden it takes to carry sin and not confess until we confess it. We don't realize how heavy the weight is until we let it go. And is there anything, Lord Jesus, that you would just bring freedom in this room? We thank you, God, for the blood of the cross, Lord, that brings freedom through forgiveness. Is there anything in our heart that we might ask for forgiveness of and the freedom that we need? Yeah, second question we just want to ask, is there anything to extend forgiveness for? We just thank you. We're not the judge. We don't, you don't sit on that throne. We don't see the heart. It is so good to not play God. It is so good not to, not to murder people with our anger spiritually. And so we just thank you for the treasure in the field this morning. We thank you for the good promise of inheritance that comes to his saints. And we just thank you for the ministry of reconciliation. Lord, we forgive. Lord, we forgive. We choose to forgive this morning. Thank you, God, for the power of the resurrection. And Lord, the, the, the celebration of forgiveness that can take place in this room. We thank you for the cross and forgiveness. As we just come to the, uh, the table this morning um, with, um, with pure hearts, 
Lord, and a, and a real faith and a belief, Lord, that has become that you're not going to leave us, leave us the poor and that you're going to offer freedom for your children. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood and your, your sacrifice for us, Lord, to bring us into family, to call us children. And we thank you for your spirit today, Lord, your very presence in us and with us as we continue through this day and this week. Let's pray that you would open our eyes, Lord, create a hunger in us for you, for your presence, for your word. Would you draw us in? In Jesus' name, everyone say it. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. I hope you guys have a good week. Don't forget to sign up for the equipping environment and for City Life if you're interested. We will see you here next week for Palm Sunday. Make your Easter plans. Um, say hi to somebody on your way out and have a great week.